Welcome, I'm Chief Barry McRoy from Colleton County Fire and Rescue. I hope that you find this video informative. It was developed to help reduce the number of fire related injuries to the citizens of Colleton County. We do thank you for your attention. And of course, if you have any questions, we do hope that you'll contact us. Hello, I'm Richard Sheffield, Fire Marshal for Colony County Fire Rescue, and with me is Engineer Paramedic Brian Rowe. We're here today to bring the citizens of Colony County a higher awareness of safety in your home. Every year in October, we visit all schools to teach elementary students fire safety. This video is intended to expand that knowledge to all ages. Last year in Colony County, we saw 15 fire-related injuries. These injuries were due to kitchen fires, improper use of fire extinguishers, as well as people going back into a burning home. In this video, we're going to discuss kitchen safety, space heaters, lighters and matches, as well as smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Along with these, we'll also discuss wood burning chimneys, pet safety, clothes dryers, and first aid for minor burns. We hope you enjoy the show. Did you know the kitchen is one of the most dangerous rooms in the house? Absolutely. You should never wear loose fitting clothing while you're cooking. You can brush up against an eye and catch it on fire. Always wear tight fitting clothing. Here are a few other simple tips to remember in the kitchen. Never leave the stove with the burner on. It only takes a few seconds for hot oil to burst into flames. And never pour oil into a hot pan as it can splash on your spill. Heat the oil up gradually. Never leave pot handles turned out. It's too easy to turn them over when you're walking by them. Always turn them to the side. And we need to remember not to let oil or grease build up on the stove. We need to keep it clean regularly because that built up oil can certainly burst into flames. I agree. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a rubber mat in front of the stove that's non slip For spills. Mm -hmm. James, what if we have a stove fire? If you have a fire on the stove, Place the lid on top of the pot, turn the burner off, remove the pot from the eye. Do not try to take the pot outside as you can spill the grease or oil on yourself or on the floor. Never ever put water on a grease fire as it can cause the fire to spread. If you cannot get the fire out, use an extinguisher. Make sure that you use the proper extinguisher for the type of fire that you're using. We could also use flour on the fire as well as baking soda if we have it available. But we should never ever put sugar on the fire. What if we have a fire in the stove or the microwave? First thing you want to do is turn the microwave or the stove off. Never open the door. If the fire does not go out in a very short amount of time, go next door to a neighbor's house and call the fire department. Never use the stove or microwave after a fire until you've had it checked out with somebody in the maintenance department. Please stand by for a video on stove fires. If your frying pan catches fire, don't panic. One, turn off the heat. Two, wet a cloth and wring it out. Three, cover the pan with the cloth or lid and let it cool. Four, don't move the pan and don't throw water on the pan. The effects can be devastating. Approximately 7% of residential structure fires can be attributed to the improper use of electric or propane space heaters. 
the overwhelming majority of these accidents can be attributed to improper use, failure to comply with the manufacturer's instructions, or complete disregard for the safe operation of a space heater. Here are some good safety tips. Make sure the heater is UL listed. Only purchase newer model heaters that have all the current safety features like overheat protection and a tip over switch. Locate the heater on a level surface away from foot traffic. Maintain at least three feet between the heater and any combustible items like drapes, bed dressings, or furniture. This is the number one cause of space heater fires. Never use a space heater to dry clothing or wet towels. And here are three other important safety tips when using space heaters. Keep children away, don't use around water, and avoid the use of extension cords. Be sure to follow these important safety tips and the manufacturer's guidance when using space heaters. The following segment will discuss the use of fire extinguishers in your home. Before using a fire extinguisher, you must understand how fire works. Fire safety, at its most basic, is based upon the principle of keeping fuel sources and ignition sources separate. There are three elements that must be present at the same time to produce fire. This is called the fire triangle. Fire must have enough oxygen to sustain combustion. There must be enough heat to reach ignition temperature. And there must be some fuel or combustible material. Together, they produce the chemical reaction that is fire. Take away any of these things and the fire will be extinguished. Fires are classified according to the type of fuel that is burning. If you use the wrong type of fire extinguisher on the wrong class of fire, you might make matters worse. It is very important to understand the four different fuel or fire classifications. Class A fires include wood, paper, cloth, trash, or plastics, or basically any solids that are not metals. Class B includes flammable liquids or flammable gases and includes grease, oil, or gasoline. Class C is energized electrical equipment and Class D includes all metals such as potassium, sodium, aluminum, and magnesium. Most fire extinguishers will have a picture label telling you which type of fire the extinguisher is designed to fight. For example, a simple water extinguisher might have a label like this, which means it should only be used on Class A fires. There are different types of fire extinguishers that are designed to fight different types of fire. The three most common are water, carbon dioxide, and dry chemical. For purposes of this video we will concentrate on dry chemical extinguishers. It is the most common found in residential homes. A dry chemical extinguisher will put out the fire by coating the fuel with a thin layer of dust. 
This separates the fuel from the oxygen in the air and breaks the fire triangle down. And, as we have previously stated, fire needs fuel, heat, and oxygen combined to survive. Dry chemical extinguishers come in a variety of types and sizes. You may see them labeled as DC for dry chemical, ABC, which means it can be used on a class A, B, or C fire, or BC, which is designed for use on class B and C fires only. It is extremely important to know which type of extinguisher is in your home. An ABC extinguisher will have a label like this, indicating it may be used on a class A, B, or C fire. You would not want to use a class A extinguisher, which is pure water, on a flammable liquid or an electrical fire. The following slides will discuss the proper technique on using a fire extinguisher. It is easy to remember how to use a fire extinguisher if you remember the acronym PASS. The first letter in the acronym PASS, P, stands for pull the pin. This will allow you to discharge the extinguisher. A is for aiming at the base of the fire. You should aim at what is burning, not the flames. Aiming at the flames will cause the extinguishing agent to fly right through and will do no good. The first S is to squeeze the handle. This will depress a button that releases the pressurized extinguishing agent. The second S is to sweep the nozzle from side to side. Do this until the fire is completely out. Start using the extinguisher from a safe distance away, then slowly move forward. Once the fire is out, keep an eye on the area in case it reignites. It is important never to turn your back to the fire area after extinguishment. The fire can spontaneously reignite without warning. And here are a few rules for fighting fires. Do not fight the fire if you do not have adequate or appropriate equipment. If you do not have the correct type or large enough extinguisher, it's best not to try fighting the fire. You might inhale toxic smoke when synthetic materials such as the nylon and coppering or foam padding in a sofa burn, they can produce hydrogen cyanide and ammonia in addition to carbon monoxide. These gases can be fatal in a very small amount. And don't fight the fire if your instincts tell you not to do it. If you are uncomfortable with the situation for any reason, leave the area immediately and dial 911. The final rule is to always position yourself with an exit or means of escape at your back before you attempt to use an extinguisher to put out a fire. In case the extinguisher malfunctions or something unexpected happens, you need to be able to get out quickly. You don't want to become trapped. And now, firefighter Anthony Harrison will demonstrate the proper technique of using a dry chemical extinguisher while using the PASS acronym. I will use the acronym PASS Pull the pin, aim the nozzle, squeeze, sweep. I will now demonstrate. Pull the pin, aim the nozzle, squeeze the trigger, sweep. In this segment, we're going to talk about smoke detectors, care and maintenance, and placement of smoke detectors in your home. The National Fire Protection Agency states that residents with a smoke detector have a 
40 to 50 percent death rate less than those homes without a smoke detector. Care and maintenance of your smoke detector would include wiping it down monthly with a damp rag or vacuuming it. Never paint over your smoke detector. You should change your battery every six months. A good way to remember that is when you change your clocks, change your battery. You should test your smoke detector monthly by pushing the button. You should have a smoke detector on every level of your home. When choosing a location for your smoke detector, the wall is ideal, six to eight inches from the ceiling. You want to mount it on the ceiling, the center of the room, or the center of the hallway. We mount the smoke detector six to eight inches from the ceiling because heat and smoke rise. Never mount your smoke detector near a corner. The corner is called the pocket of air, which does not allow the smoke to reach the detector. Carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless gas. Some of the things in your home that can produce carbon monoxide would be kerosene heaters, furnaces, gas stoves, automobiles. This may be something you want to consider if you have an attached garage. If any of these were faulty or, be, or malfunction, they can produce dangerous levels of carbon monoxide. This is one of the reasons that you recommend that you have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. When mounting your carbon monoxide detector, six to eight inches from the floor is ideal. Care and maintenance would be to keep it clean by vacuuming it regularly, wiping it down with a damp rag. You also want to test your carbon monoxide detector monthly. Change the batteries twice a year, every six months. When you set your clocks back during daylight savings, is a good reminder to change the batteries in your carbon monoxide detector, as well as your smoke detectors. Some of the signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning includes nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, dizziness, and unconsciousness. If your carbon monoxide detector was to alert, you should immediately leave the building and dial 911. The United States Consumer Safety Commission estimates that over 16,000 fires occur in clothes dryers each year. Fires can occur when lint builds up in the dryer or exhaust vent. Lint blocks the flow of air, causing excessive heat to build up and may result in fire in some dryers. Colleton County Fire Rescue recommends the following steps to help you prevent fires in your clothes dryer. You should always clean the lint screen before or after each load of clothes. Periodically, homeowners should pull your dryer away from the wall to inspect for lint buildup and ensure the flexible exhaust vent is not crimped. Flexible vents that look like this can impede the flow of air causing excessive heat buildup. Additionally, cleaning inside and underneath the dryer should be performed at regular intervals and if possible, removing the front cover of the dryer to clean around the motor. A qualified professional may be consulted for this step. If your clothing is still damp at the end of a typical drying cycle or drying requires longer time than normal, this may be a sign that the lint screen or the exhaust duct is blocked. Cleaning your clothes dryer not only reduces the chances of a fire occurring, it also reduces operating costs. Clothes dryers are one of the most expensive appliances in your home. The longer it runs, the more money it costs you. Following these simple to perform steps can save you money and will decrease your chances of a fire.
An extremely high number of people are burned each year using flammable and combustible liquids, the most popular of which are gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel. These liquids, gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel, should always be transported in approved containers. When storing these liquids, you need to be sure to store them in an outside area, away from living spaces, not inside your home. This includes garages. Quite frequently, garages have hot water heaters with gas-powered pilot lights. These pilot lights contain enough energy to ignite the vapors present in these flammable and combustible liquids, which can result in a fire or an explosion. It is essential to keep these flammable liquids, such as gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel, away from potential ignition sources, such as the pilot lights on hot water heaters, and smoking materials like pipes, cigarettes, and cigars. Flammable and combustible liquids such as gasoline, diesel fuel, and kerosene should never be used to aid in outdoor burning. Flammable and combustible liquids should also never be poured into hot portable equipment such as generators, leaf blowers, chainsaws, or lawn mowers. They should be allowed to cool before refueling. Never pour flammable and combustible liquids on a fire or hot coals. This could result in an explosion and burn injuries to anyone in the area. Remember to dispose of oil or flammable or combustible liquid soaked rags properly in the proper container. The following video demonstrates the dangers associated with fueling your vehicle and static electricity. In this video, we see a woman approaching a gasoline pump with the intent of fueling her vehicle. Vehicles are not grounded and can build static electricity during travel. By touching the vehicle body and the ground simultaneously, she removes any static electricity present in the vehicle. She activates the fuel pump and places the nozzle into the vehicle's fuel tank. However, she makes the mistake of re-entering the passenger compartment of the vehicle. While removing her feet from the ground, she builds static electricity on her clothing while it rubs on the passenger compartment interior. She exits the vehicle and discharges the built-up static electricity by touching the gasoline dispensing nozzle. The spark is sufficient to ignite the gasoline vapors present and results in a fire. She shuts off the flow of gasoline, removes the nozzle, and enters the store for assistance. This video demonstrates the low energy ignition sources, such as static electricity, that are needed to ignite flammable and combustible liquids and their associated vapors. It is essential to shut off your ignition, do not use smoking materials such as cigarettes or cigars, and avoid re-entering your vehicle while fueling it. Remember, as your vehicle travels down the road, it builds static electricity. If you have a portable gasoline or diesel fuel container in the back of the vehicle, before filling it, place it on the ground. Never fill a portable gasoline, diesel fuel, or kerosene container in the back of a vehicle. Remember, it takes a very low energy ignition source, such as a match, to ignite a flammable or combustible liquid in its vapors. Matches, lighters, and other heat sources are the leading cause of fire deaths for children. You should never underestimate your child's curiosity about fire, 
nor their ability to strike matches or start a lighter. Matches and lighters should be stored out of the child's reach and sight, preferably in a locked cabinet. Remember, even child-resistant lighters are not child-proof and should be stored securely. When a child is curious about fire or has been playing with fire, calmly and firmly explain that matches and lighters are tools for only adults to use. Instruct your toddlers to tell you when they find a match or lighter. Wyland, who should you tell when you find matches and lighters? Adults. Very good. Never use matches or lighters as amusement for your children. Children will imitate the actions of the adults. Please enjoy this short episode from the Today Show concerning our children and lighters. This morning on Today Investigates, an eye-opener on a potential fire hazard that's almost certainly in your home. Today, National Correspondent Amy Robach is here with details. Good morning to you, Amy. Good morning, Meredith. And we're talking about lighters and matches, and every year thousands of fires are accidentally started by children playing with them. Most of us think that telling our kids not to touch them is enough, but is it? We set up a hidden camera experiment to find out. We began our experiment here at the Lil Angels Daycare in Throgs Neck, New York. Our subjects, this adorable group of three, four, and five-year-olds. These are lighters. Has anyone seen one of this? First, we had Mary Kay Oppie, president of the Home Safety Council, talk to our kids about the dangers of playing with lighters and matches. Studies show kids as young as two can figure out how to work them. Matches and lighters are tools for grown-ups. They're things grown-ups use, but never kids. We told our tots, lighters and matches can burn you, and you should never, ever touch them. Would it be okay for you guys to touch? No. No. But will the message stick? Oppie says it's perfectly normal for young kids to be curious about fire. They see mom lighting the birthday cake. This is a pretty wonderful thing. That match or that lighter is really intriguing. They're going to want to get their hands on it. But every year, this kind of innocent play causes nearly 15,000 fires and devastating injuries. I realized that I was burning. Jack Sample was just eight years old when his curiosity cost him dearly. He was eating dinner when impulsively he stuck his drinking straw into a candle on the table. It sparked up and I got scared, so I dropped it on my shirt. Immediately, his shirt went up in flames. Jack suffered third-degree burns on his neck, chest, and arms. After 17 skin surgeries, he still lives with terrible scars. His mom says before the accident, she never thought to warn her son about this danger. I had no idea that something as benign as a candle burning on the table would be a draw for him. So how big a draw would fire be for our kids? I know you're going to know what to do if you see matches and lighters. The day after our talk, we came back to their playroom and left behind several lighters and matches. All had been disabled so they couldn't produce flames. Then with hidden cameras rolling and Oppie, the daycare owner, and I secretly watching from the next room, we let the kids in. Oh my God! Immediately, they found our lighters. Some did follow our experts' warning. But watch these other kids. This curious boy grabs our torch and playfully waves it around as if it's a toy sword. And look at this three-year-old. He has no fear about picking up our lighters, one in each fist, and showing them to his friends. Later, he lines them up on this shelf to play with, then stashes them in his cubby like prizes to take home. I want to say to all the parents watching this, this is normal behavior. But remember, just the day before, we'd warned these kids, lighters and matches can burn them. Have you ever heard the expression, do as I say, not as I do? It doesn't work. They see you doing it. You're not getting hurt. Why should they think they would get hurt? Now watch this curious tyke grab our torch and with finger on the trigger, try to light it over and over again. Oppie says it's age-appropriate behavior that too often turns deadly. So if a child was able to get a flame out of that lighter, how quickly could something go wrong? Within three minutes, that whole room could be engulfed. Our video was an eye-opener for the kids' parents. 
they're lighters. You wouldn't expect a child to be playing with a lighter. It's, they're attractive though. You have yeah, colors. Color. I never thought I needed to have that conversation with him at this age. So you've never had a discussion with him, never touch a lighter, never no, touch? No, I haven't. Will you I now? Now I will, yeah. <laughs> but as our experiment showed, words don't always work. Oppie says if you have kids under 10, keep your fire tools out of reach and locked up. You really need to make sure that kids don't have the opportunity to touch a match or a lighter because they're going to try. After our experiment, we again told our kids to never ever touch lighters and matches and we gave their parents child safety locks to use at home. And experts say when using fire tools, make it a teachable moment for your kids and remind them that they are adult tools which can hurt you. And if you have kids under 10, keep all matches and lighters out of reach, Meredith. It's just too tempting for kids. It's so interesting in your experiment. The boys were clearly interested. The girls were scolding them not to touch it, that it was dangerous. Is that typical? It is typical. Experts say boys tend to be more interested in these types of tools than girls, but they say this is the important thing. You can't just toss it off like, ah, oh, boys will be boys. It's a part of growing up. I like to experiment with matches as well. This can be a serious problem. So if your child is threatening to set fires or you see him or her set fires, you need to contact your local fire department or maybe even a social worker. And if a lighter says child resistant, that is not the same as child proof. Remember, our children are depending on us. Hi, I'm Pam, this is Darlene, and this is Maggie. We're here today to discuss some safety tips for you and your pet during an emergency. Be sure that your pets are part of your organized evacuation plan. Rehearse your plan repeatedly with your family, including your pets. Assemble a pet disaster kit, including a supply of your pet's food, water, vaccination records and medications, emergency contact information, including your vet's telephone number, a favorite toy, an extra leash and collar, with identification for any dogs and carriers for cats. If you have no carriers for your small animals, pillowcases can be used to help get the smaller animals safely out of the house. Listen to your pet. Animals have the ability to smell smoke long before humans. If your pet is acting strangely, look into the situation promptly and be prepared to gather your family and follow your evacuation plan. Fire experts say the number one reason animals perish in fires is because they are confined to their pens or cages and cannot escape. Be sure your fire plan accounts for crated dogs and caged cats. Research pet organizations in your area ahead of time, so you will have a place to board your animals in case of an emergency. Increase the chances of your animal's rescue by putting a sticker on your door reading, Animals Inside, In Case of Emergency, Please Rescue. Other good information to add to this is the type of animals and how many of each. When not at home, keep animals on the ground floor. They will be easier to rescue. If your animal was in a smoke-filled building, or if you can smell smoke on its fur, take it to your vet for review. Toxic fumes can be deadly. Bathe immediately and repeat if necessary. Give a key to a trusted neighbor and make sure they know where the animal might be located within the house so they can inform firefighters. Microchip your animal. If your animal gets lost during a fire, a microchip will increase your chances of being reunited. Please follow these tips to help keep you and your pets safe. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Chuck Moyer with the Collin County Fire Rescue. I want to talk with you a little bit today about chimney safety some do's and don'ts with them. 
We all know that fireplaces are a wonderful thing, especially this time of the year in the middle of winter when it's cold outside. Everybody's mesmerized by fire. You can sit and watch a fireplace burn for hours and hours and hours and never think anything about it. However, with the good, there's also some bad. Uh, and there are a number of instances every year of houses burning down because of chimney fires and things associated, fires associated with the, with the chimneys. Uh, before you burn every year, there's a number of things you probably need to do or maybe even need to look at. First and foremost would be possibly getting a, a chimney sweep to go ahead and check out your chimney, your flue liners and all that and make sure everything is intact. There's not an excess buildup of creosote uh, and uh, the outside masonry or wood structure supporting the uh, inner tile liners are in good shape to go. Once you have um, gotten your chimney inspected, and by the way, this needs to be done by somebody who is licensed and um, a professional chimney sweep and also has insurance uh, to make sure that if he messes up, you're going to be covered with it. Again, an open chimney fire burning wood is a, is a, a great source of relaxation, a great uh, source of, of joy, but also has its inherent problems. Um, on the other hand, you can go the other direction and you can use uh, maybe gas logs. You can either have natural gas or propane, depending on the area you live in and the availability of each. With burning of gas logs and whatnot, uh, they are making them so efficient in, in today's market that you actually can get just about all the heat value that goes in, you can just about get it out in your house. Uh, they're called ventless gas logs nowadays and you just have to have your, um, your flue liner open up just a very tiny little bit just to help with the combustion purposes. But you can pretty much get everything that goes into the gas logs burning back out into your house. Again though, there's some, there's some precautions that need to be done with that. Uh, if you get them, they need to be installed by a professional uh, a installer. Plumbers are always a good source, propane companies, um, uh, people who work in natural gas. Uh, make sure that they're installed professionally, they have a permit to do that, and they're licensed and bonded also. Um, there's not a whole lot of do's and don'ts with them. It's kind of hard to maneuver around to get your fuel lines adjusted and, and in place. But overall, they're, they're very nice to use. Now, they're a little bit pricey on the front side, but Considering having to haul wood everywhere you go, there's a kind of an equal trade. You can even get the gas logs with a remote control. All you have to do is just push a button, and they'll light all by themselves. It's a great little feature, but keep in mind that it's attached to your utility bill a lot of times, so you have to keep in mind versus buying wood versus paying for gas that you're going to burn in the gas log. Here are a few safety tips on fireplace safety. Install a cap at the top of the chimney to keep out debris or animals that may block the chimney. Install both a smoke and carbon monoxide detector. Make sure the area around the fireplace is clear of furniture, books, newspaper, and other potentially flammable materials. Clean out ashes from previous fires. Open the damper. Keep glass doors open during the fire. Use tools to tend the fire. Always close the fire screen when the fire is lit. This will keep the logs from rolling out of the fireplace and will keep hands, feet, and other materials from inadvertently entering the fire. Never burn garbage, roll newspapers, charcoal, or plastic in the fireplace. Never use gasoline or any liquid accelerant to help start the fire keep small children and pets away from the fireplace. Never leave the fire unattended. Do not close the damper until the embers have completely stopped burning. When cleaning the fireplace, store ashes in a non-combustible container. Now we're going to talk about first aid for minor burns. Always remember to be safe. Treatment begins by stopping the burning process. To do this, run cool water over the burned area for 5 to 10 minutes. Do not use ice. This may damage the skin. Do not put butter, grease, or ointments on the area. They tend to retain the heat. Do not break any blisters. This may lead to further infection. If the burn area has any clothes or jewelry in the immediate area, please remove due to swelling that may occur. There are three different types or degrees of burns. 
first degree burns are reddening of the skin and some pain, such as sunburns. Treatment is by topical burn ointment or spray and over-the-counter medicines for pain such as Motrin or Tylenol. Second degree is red painful blistering. Important not to break the blisters. This can occur from hot water or steam. Seek medical attention if needed. Treatment is by cooling the area with water and covering with a dry sterile dressing. Third degree, the skin may look white or dark brown in color. This can occur from placing your hand on the eye of the stove. Due to the burn being very deep in the skin, no pain may be present. Treatment is by cooling the area with cool water and covering with a dry sterile dressing, seeking medical attention immediately. The following burns need immediate medical attention. Any burns to the face, hands, or feet. Any burns to a child, an elderly person, or someone with an existing medical condition. Remember, your safety is priority. Stop the burning process. Cool with running water. Keep the area dry and seek medical attention immediately if needed. We at Collin County Fire Rescue are concerned about your safety and that of your family. In this presentation, your county firefighters have covered a multitude of fire and life safety issues. If you have any questions about anything you saw in this video, please contact us at one of the non-emergency phone numbers listed in the telephone book. You can also send us an email at info at or visit our website at colletonfire.com. We hope you found this presentation informative and helpful. Fire Rescue stands ready to serve your emergency needs 24 hours a day. Thanks for watching and have a safe day.